start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Birth Queen podcast. I have today my muse, my inspiration, um, my North Star, my my everything, my Oakland girl, Jaisha Wren here um, to be on the Birth Queen podcast. This is a long time coming, but Birth Queen really wouldn't even be a thing if it weren't for Jaisha. And that's absolute real talk. So funny story when, after I received my like download to found Birth Queen, I was still trying to figure out what it was all going to be. And I looked up and I said, God, I need to meet a black midwife. And Jaisha Wren emailed me the next day. I was on the Upper East Side walking to my private training. And I like, I literally stopped in the middle of the street and looked back up at God and was like, damn, okay, that was really fast. <laughs> um, so that was, I would say, early, like January, February 21. And here we are. So can you tell everyone there's so many things you do? Um, but who is Jaisha? Let's start there. Okay. Well, um, so I'm Jaisha Wren. I'm a midwife. And I am also program director for Beloved Birth Black Centering. So I'm part of an amazing team of Black women um, who have really developed a solution to racism-based disparities impacting us in pregnancy and birth. And so that is what brought me to Rachel. And I found her on, <laughs> I was like, look at her doing so many things. I was like, I got to reach out to her. I have to know this woman. I emailed her and I had no idea that she had just had that moment and asked for this thing. And there you go. And I was like, I'll probably never hear back. And <laughs> then you called me and I was like, okay. So I'm in I know. And when you shared everything, I immediately was like, yes, yes, yes. Like we need to do this everywhere all over the country but it was one of those things like i didn't want to like love bomb you so i, I was like <clears throat> yes okay but i can't scare her away so i'm gonna just be like cool all right we're just gonna keep doing this thing and then we realized like it's okay we're gonna love bomb each other for life and that's what we're gonna do because let's stop something you always talk about mm -hmm. that i don't know is discussed enough is weathering Mm -hmm. So can you break down for the people, yeah, for for us and for them, what is weathering when you talk about a Black person mm -hmm. in the United States of America? Yeah, yeah. So you know, we now we now really understand that racism is the root cause of these preventable high rates of preventable complications in pregnancy and in birth and in that first year postpartum um, for Black women and birthing people. Um, but sometimes people are still a little bit confused about like, how is racism causing this harm? You know, exactly how, what is the mechanism of action, if you will? Um, and so I like to break it into three main um, pathways. Uh, you can think about it through, you know, the obstetric racism pathway, which is the interpersonal, you know, discrimination, bias, you know, unconscious and conscious that we experience when we're getting healthcare. The second pathway is the systemic racism, all that structural stuff that's shaping the society that we live in and the neighborhoods that we, you know, live and work in and all of that. And then there's the third pathway, which is the weathering. And this one I feel like is a little less well understood, um, mm -hmm. but it is a really, really important one. And so um, I'm happy that you're, you know, creating this space where we can talk about it and, you know, um, help people really understand why the interventions that we're doing are so important to address weathering. But basically what it is, is it's the recognition that racism, experiencing racism is stressful. Now, what we know about human bodies is that if you experience some stress that's short term, that's fine. Our bodies are designed to be able to handle that. Um, you can you know, experience the stress, come through it, um, and your body can kind of go back to a healthy baseline. But let's say you're experiencing stressors all the time. These mm -hmm. stressors are just really chronic stressors. Um, then you can develop, you know, what the, you know, uh, researchers call chronic stress. And when you're under long-term stress like that, that's really what ends up wearing down our bodies. Our bodies can't handle that as well. Can't, you know, respond to the stress and then go back down, down-regulate the stress to a healthy baseline. Instead, we just kind of stay up here, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, biologically and physiologically. That's what happens when you live in New York City. You're just kind of <laughs> stay up here. Yeah. Portis, <laughs> like, oh shit. Oh, 
there's like another level. I didn't know that. And now I go up when I drive into New York City. I'm like, and that's that thing that I need to go back to. Yeah. yeah. I'm drinking wine yet, but I'm I'm just trying to hydrate because I sound like a, I love that glass. That, glass. You know what? that yes. brings me joy Black. just to do that. I think I, I'm gonna start that drinking water out of that. Maybe if I feel better about my morning hydration. Yeah, out of a wine at wine glass, wine make everything better. Why not? Why not? Um, but yeah, so so this whole concept of you know physiological stressors that's chronic and how this wears down our bodies and how researchers can actually see differences on the you know the biological, the cellular level and how our bodies are functioning mm-hmm. and understand that okay, if we are you know on 10 with our stress up high all the time and don't have that down regulation of the stress enough, then what happens is our bodies can't cope as well and we end up predisposed to illness, all kinds of illnesses in general, um, but particularly also complications in childbirth and pregnancy and postpartum. So this, um, these impacts also are related to the intergenerational impacts of stresses. And so that's the other tricky part is that it's not even about the chronic stress that, you know, each individual experiences in their life, but it's actually, you know, impacted by the chronic stressors that our ancestors, particularly our mothers, grandmothers experienced. So Mm -hmm. what the research is showing is that our grandmother's experience of stress actually impacts our risk of preterm birth. And so when we think about this in the context of African-Americans and why we see such high rates of preventable complications in pregnancy, when we don't see those same rates in recent African immigrants, and we look at what was happening to our grandmothers here in this country through the slave trade and all the hundreds of years um, that we've had of of the you know the, the traumatic experiences um, due to the different forms of racism that we've experienced, um, we can understand why that's a lot of stress. And so we are inheriting that stress. It's in our bodies. It lives in our bodies, and the way our bodies are able to respond to the stressors we experience in our lives, um, and and how well we're able to stay well and healthy. I feel like, thank you for that. A a hot topic right now because of the unfortunate loss of Tori Bowie is preeclampsia. Can you please break that down? Because what's dangerous to me is there's an explaining away, um, especially with that topic of Tori. It was like, oh, she had Mm preeclampsia. As if we should be okay that she's no longer with us as a result of that. So it, it, it... I would love that because I think there's just this, well, most black people have that. And most people, and so it's like acceptable. And that's problematic for me because it also then puts the onus on the black body that stress mm-hmm. and racism and therefore whatever, you know, diagnosis we have is our fault. Um, and I know that's not the case, but if you could clarify for us, that would be amazing. Yeah, you know, preeclampsia is getting so common and it is something we cannot normalize it because it's not normal. It's far from normal. It's like one of the most abnormal and most serious dangerous complications of pregnancy there is. And mm-hmm. as we can see, it's, you know, um fatal too often. Um uh, and even when it's not fatal, even when we do survive it, it has serious implications for our future health. Um, you know, years down the road after pregnancy, our risk for heart disease and other things. So it's very serious. And it is absolutely related to this whole pathway of the chronic stress and the effects of racism that end up causing our blood pressure to get too high um, and causing the other complications and sequelae from that. So preeclampsia, for those that don't know, is um, a complication related to high blood pressure, but it's much bigger than just blood pressure. So, you know, having, you know, high blood pressure or hypertension is one thing, um, but then preeclampsia is a, is a kind of unique complication that can happen to folks in pregnancy or actually in the early postpartum period as well. So it's important for people to understand that, that it can happen in the, you know, the weeks after birth. Um, but preeclampsia is a disease that ends up involving and harming um, a lot of other organs and body systems. So harming Mm -hmm. our kidneys, harming our liver, um, and actually can cause seizures and and can be fatal, as I said. And so it really, um, yeah, it's it's a really scary one. And it's becoming more and more prevalent in terms of what I can see just anecdotally. um, As a midwife, I'm seeing it more and more among our Black women, and I'm seeing the headlines. And so 
um, we're right now, you know, crunching numbers and, and trying to, you know, uh, look at our data to get some solid stats to understand, you know, what are our rates right now that we're seeing with our black birthing people um, in Alameda County and Oakland and Alameda County. Um, it's, it's actually quite a lot of work in the medical record to get accurate data on, on these complications. Um, but we're, we're embarking on that journey because we know it's super serious and super dangerous. And so um, there's a lot that needs to be done to respond to it. What are the signs like and symptoms that people should be looking out for? Yeah. So um, I'll say also, you know, while it's super important for people to know the signs and symptoms, preeclampsia can not have any symptoms at all. So you could develop preeclampsia and have no idea that you are ill at all. Um, and so it is sneaky. <laughs> and for that reason, I think- can... that high blood pressure is the silent killer, right? Because exactly. you don't- Exactly. Exactly. And a lot of times, you know, honestly, you don't experience symptoms until it's very, very, very advanced. So the goal is to catch it before it's that advanced, right? The goal is that yeah. you don't even get to that point that you have symptoms. But let me just run through some of the symptoms, you know, because of course, we all need to know that as black women, as you know, birthing people and the families and those that love black women <laughs> know the right. signs and symptoms of preeclampsia. Um, so headache. Now, I'll say another thing about the signs and symptoms. A lot of them are some of the same symptoms we get that are, you know, classified as just kind of common discomforts, just side effects of pregnancy, right? So sometimes it's about severity. And so a lot of people have headaches in pregnancy, maybe, you know, dehydration, you know, just the response to the hormone changes of pregnancy, um, not right. getting sleep, right? Um, but but a preeclampsia headache is is typically that's like a severe headache. So this is one that, you know, it's super, super severe. People often describe it as like the worst headache of their life that doesn't go away with, you know, taking a nap, with hydrating, with eating a snack. Um, and it doesn't go away with some Tylenol. You know, if any of that is happening, that's a suspicious for preeclampsia for sure. Um, and then also um, visual changes. So if you got the headache and you also have visual changes, like you're seeing spots, you're seeing, you know, your vision is blurry. That's another sign um, of possible preeclampsia. Also getting very, a lot of swelling, um, sudden weight gain from, from water, from swelling. Uh, it, um, again, lots of pregnant ladies. We get puffy. Fluid retention is a normal thing that happens in pregnancy, but this would be a more extreme form of it. Okay. And so a lot of times you might have a little puffy feet, you know, pregnant ladies, you may not be able to fit in your shoes. Like this is all, you know, we've all kind of seen this, this is common, but if you not only can't fit in your shoes, but your hands are super swollen and your face is super swollen. Um, then that's that's a red flag for sure. Um, and then also you may experience pain where your liver is. So remember I said that this impacts mm -hmm. your organs, like your kidneys and your liver. So mm -hmm. your liver is actually on the right side and it's right kind of if you, you know, go just below in your rib area, your liver's back there. And so if you get some pain there, then that could be a sign of preeclampsia as well. And so um, those are some of the, the big symptoms. Sometimes it presents with other things like sudden nausea and vomiting, you know, and usually preeclampsia is presenting towards the end of pregnancy. And most people, their nausea and vomiting is resolved by then for, for most people, some unlucky ones are just vomiting the whole pregnancy. <laughs> Occasional. Yeah, like most people, <laughs> for most people, you know, you're nauseous and you're vomiting in the first trimester, maybe a little bit in the second trimester, but then by third trimester, that, that symptom of side effect of pregnancy is gone. You feel good. But if all of a sudden at the end of pregnancy, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, why am I vomiting like crazy again? Could be a sign of preeclampsia. Okay. And since I just feel like I have to use this time and space and because you're a midwife to validate, um, you know, I'm a trainer and I was a Nike trainer and the Tory situation really, it hit me really, 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 really hard um, because you know, a lot of times people with the Black maternal health crisis easily want to make it a those Black people issue. Mm -hmm. Those poor Black people, those overweight Black people, those ones with other, you know, conditions, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I like, it's not. It's it's a all, all Black women, no matter what your socioeconomic status is or health history, right? That's not the, you know, I, I always am like, we have to make that clear. Mm -hmm. And we almost lost Serena Williams. And which it took her white, very wealthy husband to threaten everyone for them to listen to her because she's the GOAT, right? She's strong. She's fine. And so with Tori, what's so scary is because she was a Nike athlete and Allison Felix was a Nike athlete that got dropped when she got pregnant. Mm -hmm. I also got dropped 
from Nike when I got pregnant. Um, and so the, I know the stress she was feeling as a premier athlete to perform. And so to know, I even feel for that like emergency team that had to be there to wit bear witness to a baby that had probably been ejected out of her body and her by herself. It's... It's something that I, I think is not clearly talked about enough. The amount of stress to be that perfect mom, but then go back and perform at that level mm -hmm. to maintain sponsorships and titles. And it's like, it just happened with Naomi Osaka as well. She was training at 15 days postpartum. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that cannot happen. But again, you have a black woman who's a premier athlete feeling the pressure. Literally, Serena retired to have another baby yeah. because she had to choose. Yeah. And men never have to do that. Yeah. Um, but it is it is a stressor. I mean, even as if I put my actor crown on, there's so many Black actresses who I believe have chosen to wait a long time to have a baby or not have one because they're so worried about what's going to happen with their body or their image or their career because they, it's mm -hmm. a very hard career. Um, and having a baby physically is very hard on you. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just want to toss that out there because it is all interconnected and it just, it, it breaks my heart. Um, you know, luckily we still have Naomi, but uh, you know me, I'm worried about her pelvic floor, but also her mental health. You need to heal. So can you just also talk about the body postpartum and how important it is to heal? Because in our society, other cultures like Asian cultures, like really still to this day, prioritize a woman's healing, but we do not. Um, so if you can kind of break down like all the whys you need to lay down a postpartum. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You just said so much, so much, so much. I know. Sorry. That was like, like so I got on my little things. box. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where to even start? You know, um, I think it's important for people to understand that first of all, on what you said, racism is an independent driver of these poor outcomes. So it is not just about socioeconomic status. It is actually, you know, that's a layer on top of what can make right. pregnancy and life and birth and surviving postpartum harder, of course, um, if you're being, you know, economically disenfranchised and you don't have the basic needs and resources, but also you can be under a tremendous amount of stress, even though you are well-resourced. Um, and yep. so we've seen that from, you know, uh, you know, black women who've shared and black women who have not made it, um, you know, like Tori. And so it's, it's really, really important for people to get that part um, and understand that just racism impact alone can cause that kind of severe and fatal outcome with preeclampsia. You don't have to have had any, you know, preexisting conditions or, you know, had any poor health life choices beforehand. You know, these are some of the, the narratives that have been spun is like, well, you know, maybe it's just that black people weren't, you know, getting regular health care and maybe they were making poor lifestyle choices. Maybe they weren't eating right, or maybe they weren't exercising enough or, you know, all these kinds of things that in the past have been thrown out there as explanations about why we would have these um, really tragic outcomes. Um, but yeah, situations like this um, really show that, uh, no, that's, that's not what's going on. <laughs> And um, that's just how dangerous racism is and how severe stress can, can harm us. And so thank you for bringing that up and pointing that out. Um, but when it comes to postpartum, you know, what we're seeing in the data is that when you look at maternal mortality around the country, um, a very, very, very large portion of the deaths are happening in the first year of postpartum once our postpartum care has ended. So for me as a midwife and, you know, my OBGYN colleagues, you know, in our medical system, we take care of people. You have your prenatal visits and pregnancy. And then in postpartum, uh, you have your final visit at six to eight weeks postpartum, usually around six. And that's it. And then we're done. And then it's bye. <laughs> and, you know, again, that the kind of, you know, story told, you know, in medical world in this country was like your postpartum healing is done at six weeks. And now you just kind of go back to your life. Um, even though we know that that is not the case, that actually um, there is still so much healing to be done. 
And, right. um, and that needs to be supported. And if we don't support it, it can actually be life threatening. If we don't support the safety and healing and care of people who just right. gave birth for at least the first year, then we can lose mothers. And that's what yeah. we're seeing. Now. And so, um, we really know that postpartum care needs to extend through the first year. Uh, we need to be checking on people, especially people who experience preeclampsia in pregnancy, because that's a red flag. Again, they're at higher risk of some of the other things. You know, one of the other big drivers of maternal mortality is cardiomyopathy right now, cardiac problems. So um, again, high blood pressure, cardiac problems, this is all connected and, um, and a huge risk factor. Also, you know, diabetes is huge and that predisposes us, increases our risk for other things like the cardiac problems. And so um, a lot of our folks are getting diabetes in pregnancy. So that's another um, important risk factor to think about and, and a sign that like, okay, the body's under stress. We know that. And right. so we have to take extra care now. Um, and so it's really, you know, the reason that we're not supporting mothers is, is, is a policy choice in our country that we've decided that we don't want to support them. And we've decided apparently through our policy choices that we're just going to, we're okay with these statistics of these high rates of maternal mortality. And we're 50 to 60th in the world in maternal mortality. And we're one of the only countries that oh, does For the people in the back. <laughs> yeah. 50th, 50th in the world. So that means that every other industrialized country and many countries who we'd still consider developing um, have mm better rates, have more mothers surviving childbirth. So the United States is actually one of the most dangerous places to have a baby, regardless of the fact that we spend twice as much money on our healthcare system for this. So it's not for lack of resources, not for lack of care. It's just that we're not doing or structuring the care well. We're not spending our money, our resources well to actually provide for and take care of women. We don't have a national healthcare system. We have a bunch of racism. So all of these things are leaving new mothers in that year postpartum often, you know, dealing with the stresses of racism um, without the care. And I want to highlight, like, maternal health sucks for all women in this country. And there is a Black maternal health crisis. Yes. So I want anyone that hears this, sees this, like, you are not immune if you're not Black. Like, you should be fully invested in in improving health care for Black women because it improves your health care. Yes. Yes. So it's, it's, exactly. you know, I think a lot of times we're like, oh, that doesn't affect me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, you know, Alexis didn't think he would ever have to advocate for his wife mm -hmm. or worry about his wife stepping out of a hospital alive. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Until he went, oh, but then on the flip side to take it off of black people, I just was in Iowa doing my consulting and there was this amazing, um, uh, OB male, of, of Chinese heritage, who said he was an engineer who used to take his grandmother to her checkups. Mm -hmm. And they assumed they didn't speak English. Okay. And they would talk shit about them. And he's an engineer. And he was forever changed as a result of that experience with his grandmother to go, he witnessed how complex women's health is and how many contributing factors there are that to a woman's health. And mm -hmm. so he became an OB and he did his res residency in Arizona with a lot of midwives. So we love Willis. Shout out to Willis in Iowa. Love him. City Point Health. Yes, you would. Everybody loves Willis. He's got a man bun. He's amazing. Uh, but he got it. You know what I mean? And so it's just, there's a lack of, of prioritization of the woman's care across the board. Um, Anyways, I want you to have time to really dive into all things um, Highland Hospital, all the magic you're creating in my hometown of Oakland um, with Beloved Birth Life Centering. Um, so yeah, break down how, how did you come to giving birth to your baby girl? We're boy moms, so I feel like birth queen's my girl and love oh. is your girl. Yeah. Um, so yeah, share with us all things your baby girl. Yes. So like I said, I'm part of a wonderful team of Black women who have been able to come together to create a solution. And Beloved Birth is almost three years old now. So we are about to celebrate um, three years on October 2nd. We're having a party. If you're in uh, the Bay Area, come celebrate with us. New Parkway Theater. Find us on Eventbrite. Beloved Birth. Having a film screening. Anyway. Um, <laughs> 
It's going to be that. I'll make sure. Tiana Moore, just going to shout that out. Our amazing alumni, Tiana Moore, has starred in an H24 film that is amazing. Earth Mama will really just get to your heart. Like it's, yeah. Um, beautiful story about Black motherhood in Oakland. Um, but yeah, so our program, you know, when I went through my sociology program, I didn't know anything about uh, racism based disparities. I didn't know that I was three to four times more likely to die in childbirth until I was studying sociology at a college level. Before that, I had never heard this. Um, and so that really radicalized me and realizing how um, all of these forms of oppression, racism being, you know, primary driver are really um, coming together to, to threaten our survival. And that just fired me up to figure out, you know, first of all, I knew like, I knew immediately this is wrong. It doesn't have to be this way. Obviously, we know as black mothers, we are not broken. This is not happening because there's something wrong with us. Well, yeah. we far from broken. <laughs> no. I, let me tell you something. I'm so tired of being superhuman. No more. So what I what I know is we are super powerful. Absolutely. We We're know who's strong. Think from broken. Yeah. <laughs> so I just was so upset to think, okay, why is this being accepted and normalized? This is what? unacceptable. These numbers are unacceptable. So how can I dedicate my life to being part of a change? Because I don't want to see these numbers continue to my children, their children, their children, because already this has been going on since the beginning of tracking statistics, right? So I felt like this was the best way that I could apply myself. And so I studied all the things that help, you know, what are all the things that show impact that can reduce these preventable complications for black mothers and birthing people and knowing that there must be things because this is not, we're not just doomed. You know, and sure enough, there are things. It's just that we're not implementing them on scale across this country. Again, policy choices, right? Um, so I went to midwifery school because midwifery turns out is key part of the solution here. Um, countries that have black midwives for everybody, black midwives. Countries that have midwives that maintained midwives at the center of their maternity care systems, being that primary care provider for pregnant people, have healthier outcomes. Period. Um, and so it's really important. Midwives uh, have been the holders throughout, you know, the beginning of humankind birthing. Midwives are the profession that have learned and understood how pregnancy and birth works, how this physiology works, how to keep things normal, how to support the normal process. Um, and really, uh, you know, at this point, a lot of our, our complications are happening from over medicalization. So while we sometimes do need medical intervention, it's important that us as midwives have doctors to work with, to partner with um, on things like severe preeclampsia, for example, that may need some higher level medical care. Um, we can also help prevent a lot of those complications as well um, by focusing on the holistic preventative care. So that's what us midwives do. Um, so anyway, I did a whole scan of like across the country and across the world, what are the things that are working? Um, and, and saw, you know, a handful of things that I'm like, okay, here's solutions. I need to put all those things together because the problem is really, really big. Right. So we can't just do like one solution. Um, we really know that if we're going to move the needle, if we're going to reverse these, um, statistics, we've got to put everything together. So that's what beloved birth is. I went and became a midwife. I went to UCSF's nurse midwifery program. I came right out and went straight to Alameda Health System Highland Hospital. Um, and really, uh, you know, was a midwife for a few years before we were able to get the political will in the organization to do this project, which really came from our public health department. And so our public health department um, is, is amazing dedication. They have amazing dedication to health equity. And in 2018, our legislature in California passed the Perinatal Equity Initiative, which released funds for folks in the counties to target infant mortality among Black birthing people, um, the disparity there. And so um, we had been doing group prenatal care at Highland Hospital for a long time, almost 10 years, um, but never had it been combined with these other anti-racist strategies. Uh, and mm -hmm. so public health department came to us and they said, do you want to partner on this? And I was like, yes, it's only like my whole entire dream come true. And so, <laughs> so that really became the moment where we had the resources and the people to sit down and be like, okay, what are all the strategies? Let's put it together in a package. And so we have five evidence-based strategies in Beloved Birth Black Centering. And we call it a gold package of Black love because this goes way beyond the regular kind of clinical prenatal care that people experience across the country. Um, our program, first strategy, all Black care team, racial concordance. So when we have people having access to healthcare providers, being cared for by folks who are from their community, of their community, understand them, um, we see that there is better communication, there is more trust, there is more understanding, and there are better health outcomes. So mm -hmm. that's 
important strategy that we use. So Love and Birth Black Centering is, like I said, a group of Black women. We are us. <laughs> and and um, it's a beautiful thing. We've got our Black midwives. we got our Black family support advocates, our Black doctor, our Black lactation consultants, um, you know, our Black doulas. we got the whole care teams, all Black everything. And um, our second evidence-based strategy is uh, midwifery-led group prenatal care, so centering pregnancy. Um, centering pregnancy is an amazing model of group care. It's practiced all over the country. We are a licensed site of Centering Healthcare Institute, and Centering Healthcare Institute has published some amazing data showing what is the impact of care in a group. As you know, most places in the, in the country, prenatal care is one-on-one. -on -one. You go in, you have your short visit, maybe 10 to 15 minutes with your doctor, your midwife, and, um, you know, they ask you some screening questions. Are you having any of those danger sign symptoms, like the symptoms preeclampsia we talked about? You know, check your vitals. We listen to baby's heartbeat. We measure how baby's growing. And then it's basically done. <laughs> you know, um, it's pretty short and too short to really do um, much else. And it's too short for people to actually be engaged, active participants who have agency over their care. It's too short for informed decision-making or shared decision-making for education um, and too short, short for stress reduction. So yeah. Centering, yeah, centering pregnancy is a two hour group visit where you get community, you get stress reduction happening, um, you get informed, you get to be actually knowing what's going on with your body and your health and better able to actually make decisions for your care and navigate that. Um, it's right. an empowerment model where mamas are checking their own blood pressure, again, taking back the power into their hands of like, this isn't healthcare is not something that's going to be done to me. Right. I'm actually going to you know, learn these tools of ways to check on my health. And I'm going to have my own pregnancy log that I'm filling out that I'll share with my midwife and we'll look at it together. You know, that's the model of centering pregnancy. And it's a beautiful model where people get that, you know, community in a group of, you know, eight to 12 other mamas. And it's not just mamas, it's dads too. It's a family model, which is so important. Um, and all of our groups, again, midwifery led. So the data on centering says that when we do care in a group like this, what do you know? Preterm birth goes down, low birth weight goes down. So babies are more likely to be full term, healthy weight. And we know that, you know, those two things are key drivers of infant mortality. So a baby is more at risk for infant mortality if they were born too soon or too small. And that is impacting us as black people um, way more often. So this is key statistics. Um, and so uh, also, though, we see that centering pregnancy reduces risk of postpartum depression, which suicide now is a leading cause of maternal mortality, postpartum. So that's a really serious thing. Um, we've got to address the depression issues um, and also uh, improve success with breastfeeding and all of this. So um, that's really the core of our model. That's, that's, that's only number two, though. That's only strategy number two. We keep going. Um, strategy number three is the wraparound social support. This is how we get along. This is how we get along. I know. I got to hurry it up. Um, strategy number three, wraparound social support. So racism is, 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 a social, is a social problem, right? So we know that a solution can't just be clinical. It's got to also, it's got to be social. We got to bring the social um, resources and supports together with the clinical. And so we are a partnership with Alameda Health System, the healthcare provider, and Alameda County Public Health Department. So Beloved Birth is literally revolutionizing prenatal care from within our safety net public healthcare system that already is receiving public dollars to take care of us, right? But hasn't been doing these evidence-based strategies and doing it in a coordinated way. So we're saying- you know, like Every other city in America can do what Jaisha is doing. Absolutely. It's not rocket science. It's really not rocket science. It's she just making a give you the blueprint. Yes. It's making a commitment to be like, oh, what are the things that work? Okay, let's do that. Let's let black yeah. women lead that effort and just do care differently, right? So we have a partnership. Our groups are uh, facilitated by one Alameda Health System midwife and one public health department family support advocate. So our group participants, one-stop shop. You get your social needs met. You get your clinical needs met. We're listening to baby's heartbeat. We're also, you know, giving you resources. Maybe you need supplies. Maybe you need help with housing. Maybe Genius. you need employment, right? All together. One because, stop. Yes, one stop, which is really important because how it is right now in a lot of public health systems, Talk where about we're it. serving people who are been economically disenfranchised and have a bunch of different needs, we make the, we put it on the responsibility on the pregnant person, on the mama to go all around town, all around the county to go and get all the things. Oh, go to WIC for this. You need your nutrition. You got to go to this place. You need your medical visit. You got to go over here. You need your social support. You know, your nurse, you know, home visit. You got to go over here. Everything's scattered around. And what ends up happening is a lot of moms, for one, don't know all the resources that are there. Yep. And two, wouldn't have the time to go take advantage of them, even if they do know Or that. transportation. Transportation, getting there. The logistics of accessing 
So it's one thing for the public health system to be like, check, we, we, we stood up a program, right. check. Model car, and when you're pregnant, you are tired. You can't, our mamas can't be going all around town all week. It's a full-time right. job to go find all the resources. So we can't, it, that's not functional, right? So of course, it's a no-brainer. Like it's obvious why we see, oh, why aren't the people taking up the resources? Why aren't people using it? And why isn't it effective to prevent the complications and take care of people? Because it's not designed well. It's not designed efficiently and conveniently. So centering group care allows us to put all the resources that the pregnant person may need in one place that they're already coming to for their prenatal visit. Not rocket science. It's pretty simple. <laughs> I'm going to... Don't forget your last two. But I promise you, when I went to Iowa, I called my friend and I was like, D, I'm, I'm walking into this really fancy dinner with all of these cross sector people. And then I'm in Iowa. But it's really not that complicated to fix this problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, maybe it's just obvious to me. But you know, it's really not that hard. So that's the, that's the really, the, I think the takeaway, the theme of today is there are so many black people dying, but we can fix it because yeah. we already have the money, the facilities. Yeah. We need to train more black birth workers yes. that we don't have. Yes. Um, so we need to unlock more funding for that, mm -hmm. but it's there. I just wanted to say like, this should end on a high note. Like Jaisha did it for y'all. So every, all 49 states and how many cities exist in this country? Call her, please. Okay, last two pillars. Yes, I know. We're not even done with evidence-based strategies. So, number four. Strategy, sorry. Education. Yes, yes. Whatever you want to call it. Um, evidence-based strategy number four is our culturally aligned childbirth education. So, again, we must have birth people well-informed and empowered to understand what's going on in their bodies, to understand what their care options are, or else how are we going to be healthy and safe, right? Um, and so that piece of the informational empowerment is super important. And there has not been childbirth education that was biased for us in any kind of substantial way that addressed the issues that are coming up for us for like one, how is racism harming our health? Like that handout, when I was going through midwifery school, I was like, how do I talk to the people that I'm serving about this? Where's the handout? Ask my professors, you know, well, we have handouts on all this other stuff. We have a handout on gestational diabetes. We have a handout on all this other stuff. Where's the handout on this crisis? Where's the handout that explains what is going on with this, right? That didn't exist. So we've created it and we've created a bunch of other handouts and our handouts, you know, so often, unfortunately, medical patient education is very white. Um, a lot of times you don't see people of color in these materials. A lot of times when you do I need these handouts, girl. Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm going to send it to you. And a lot of times when you do see them, you're like, mm, that doesn't look like actually, that looks like maybe you took the white character and you just painted them brown. Like, you know how they like color them a different color. It's kind of like yeah. with Barbie, you know, where you like, you had Barbie, but then like, look, there's black Barbie. And it's but like, she ashy, like <laughs> it's not a real black woman. So <laughs> the patient, it was, milky, it was like milky black face. <laughs> I'm like, that's not thing. Does the text speak to us? We can tell you just painted her brown and the same white writer wrote the handout and it's not giving what it needs to give. So, you know, right. sometimes it's completely ignoring elephants in the room. Sometimes it's, you know, being offensive about um, us as people. Like, for example, on a list of risk factors, like what are the risk factors for gestational diabetes? Black race. You put Ooh. black race on the risk factor list. This is very common. It's a lie. And this is, again, part of the narrative that this is because of that black. That is your fault. Right. Exactly. That was my point right. earlier. Right. In my genetics or my African ancestry, something, whatever it is to do with blackness is the cause of this, which is not true. It's exposure to racism, as we talked about. And so this is, um, you know, these are some of the lies, the inaccuracies um, and shortfalls of some of the traditional patient education. So our childbirth, childbirth education is completely different. It's written by us, for us, by our black midwives, written from a birth justice, reproductive justice, you know, racial equity lens. And it's beautiful. We have an amazing artist, shout out to Candy Kismet, our amazing illustrator, gorgeous pictures of thriving black women. Because the weathering, we can't be having materials that are just doom and gloom and stress because that's scary and stressful. So again, we have to address right. Stress and we have to de stress so our materials do that. They are celebratory, they're beautiful, they're engaging. So, anyway, that's our fourth strategy. We spend a lot of time on that. Strategy number five is doula. Doula collaborative, they're amazing. All of our participants get free doulas, and doulas are really helpful for supporting the labor process as well as helping um, people advocate for themselves in the birth room. I mean, you're just everything. Um, yes, so I think. What I've learned in this work, you know, back to my silly comment about when I went to Iowa is that I think it's just obvious to, uh, 
to us. And so be careful with that. Like the, the moral of that silly story that I'm sharing is I am, you know, in this work, I got to be privileged to meet Jaisha and be deeply invested in her work. So we see all different angles of this issue and therefore can provide a 360 um, point of view of solutions. And so call on us. <laughs> we will help you figure this out. Like it's, it is a behemoth, but there are tangible um solutions that are not that are very tactile that are very accessible and that are not super expensive right um and i i just that part is huge and the hope i think that probably a lot of the increased rates of preeclampsia are our awareness that there is a crisis mm -hmm. right we're very black women are now very conscious of that so how do you pull that that black joy back in that elevation of the birth queen for me like it is imperative that we can come back into ourselves understanding that we come from queens we don't come from lack and you just you guys are just doing such an amazing job of celebrating all that is a birth queen and i want to just give you guys your your shout out for that because i know you work very hard um, and not get paid a lot to do all that you do, which, you know, I want to let everybody know that midwives, this is some God work, doulas, it's some some goddess work we do. Um, and we are tired, but we are passionate and loving humans. But we also have to remember to love on the birth worker. They also need rest um, and care to continue to be able to do this. And we need to value that work. So that's, I think, a whole nother thing. But before we end, not that you haven't given birth to enough, let me ask you this. What's your biggest, has been your biggest push moment? Biggest push moment. I think we're going through a huge push moment right now because guess okay. what? We are about to launch a working group to expand Beloved Birth through the first year of postpartum. So you know what we talked about, about the postpartum, guess what? Centering Healthcare Institute has another model of care called Centering Parenting. This model is built on the well child visits, the uh, pediatric visits, or, you know, sometimes it's family medicine, but you know, right. visits for the baby <laughs> that happened in the first year, yeah. um, built on that model. So instead of, you know, doing your group visits for prenatal, you're doing your group visits for those visits for the, the child. But instead of just the child being checked, it's a dyad model, meaning that the mother birthing person also is getting checked up, which thank like you. I Thank you. We can't just First leave. All, can we talk about the six week checkup being a patriarchal penis? Yes. Penis? Okay. It's, thank you. It's, no. So yeah, we cannot. You're like, You're fine. I'm like, am I? Yeah. I'm going to stop pretending. Yes. The postpartum care ends in six weeks. We're done with that. We're done with that. Um, so this is the whole push. This is how beloved birth is going to address um, and really ch change the paradigm of what postpartum care looks like. So our mm -hmm. group our groups of mamas, our families that just received group prenatal care and were together, you know, their whole entire pregnancy developing in this community and relationships. Now, right. instead of saying goodbye at six weeks postpartum and not, you know, having any more group visits, they get to stay together. And instead the care team, I know, and the care team slightly changes. So now we bring in our pediatrics team and baby gets checked up. Okay. So all those well child visits about the milestones in the first year that parents are coming to, guess what? Our mamas are still coming to those visits but then themselves, they haven't been getting checked, right? So we've got to, again- I didn't get a speaker until I was pregnant again. Like exactly. I, exactly. I didn't go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. I had my six week mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. I was pregnant again. And I, she's like, when's the last time you've been to the doctor? I was like- Last pregnancy, exactly. Yeah. This is what happens to our, our younger, you know, reproductive age women, especially when you have pressure from work. Like you said, your career is putting pressure on you. And that's true whether you are, you know, um, working at kind of like typical regular kind of nine to five, or you're somebody who's like, you know, Naomi Osaka, or these other people like you, all the whole spectrum, you're pressured to go back to work immediately. You're pressured to perform. We're not giving enough paid leave. And so we're working, 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 not That's having to time. Another, 
not having time to take care of ourselves, sometimes ignoring danger signs or symptoms we may be experiencing because for one, there also may be no access to primary care. I have patients who finish Beloved who need primary care doctor management of complications and are told, oh, I have a patient right now who was told, she calls me, she's like, I tried, I went to that referral, you tried to refer me to primary care. They told me that the soonest available appointment was March. She gave birth months ago. They told her to wait till March. That's what I'm saying. It's crazy making. So we have to develop centering parenting so that we can continue to care for our mamas through that first year. And I don't have to try to rely on sending them to some primary care appointment that they actually don't have access to. And so then they get to continue the group centering, you know, community-based model where they continue to get the mental health, the social stress reduction. We got yes. at the isolation, the depression that our moms are experiencing because it's depressing. Breastfeeding, I'm sure it's going to help that. Of course. Because oh, it's I a open breastfeeding circle. Lactation consultant. I'm like, Tanifer, can we have you at every parenting session? That's my dream is that the care team for the group visits and parenting include our pediatric, our amazing black pediatricians at Alameda Health System. Oh my God, led by Dr. Pamela Sims Mackey. Shout out to her. She is down and ready. She has staffed up black pediatricians, so it's not just her anymore. And she has a beautiful team ready to jump in and do this adaptation of centering parenting with us. And so we- Amazing. Yes, we're gonna have black pediatricians, we're gonna have midwives, we're gonna have lactation all together through the whole first year. So our mamas will not be just flung out to the community to be like, continue working and ignoring your health and not getting taken care of, you know? No more, no more. Okay, but how can, this is a system question. How can we provide this for people that are not, like Medicaid. Is there money? Are there monies? Do we need a payer to invest in that? Any system could decide to change and do care this way is the reality. You know, we happen to be. I I chose to work in our public health system because I felt like that was the place of greatest need and the place right. that I should go is like, okay, where are people most disenfranchised? You know, but as right. we said, the risks of racism are true, whether or not you are, you know, low income or a famous celebrity with billions of dollars. Like, so well, I think the isolating factor is mm-hmm. worse, I would say, for Beyonce. No. Like, who's calling Beyonce? Like, girl, how you doing after them twins? What does that look like for her? Oh, my God. No, like, people are like, you're ridiculous. When I started my salon dinners, I'm like, I need Serena. I need to create a safe space for Beyonce and Serena. And they're like, yeah. for real? I'm like, for real? Yeah. Because it's isolating and the pressure mm-hmm. to perform and to deliver and... She's still their mama. Snap they back. Don't know she's Beyonce. They do not. Her kids aren't like, oh, mom, did you? Are you tired from your tour? No, they do like, mommy, mommy, mommy. That's what they're doing. Mm-hmm. They, and they need their mom. Yeah. And where's her little community, you know, group supportive care environment? Where's her, Where you know, like, I ain't okay. Exactly. I'm tired. But that's the bigger thing as black women. We don't even know. It wasn't a couple of years ago. I finally was like, damn, I don't think I've ever said I'm not okay. Cause who asks? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why, you know, when we have sister friends that are really friends, it's like, girl, how are you? Nah, for real. Mm-hmm. You like girl exhausted. <laughs> like, even when we're not okay, we look okay on the outside. Usually we, we still- have no choice. We don't we have a choice. Do- exactly. Cause we, we have to do the work. If the need yeah. is still there, we have to keep working, right? We have to mm-hmm. keep solving. We have to keep building. We have to keep creating. We have to keep being strong and being the rock. But the reality is we may be very not okay. <laughs> We're very not. Yeah, girl, I'm, I'm here for the soft life. If you have not listened to Hard Life by Summer Walker, Summer Walker, if you ever hear this, that whole EP is giving me life, okay? Hard mm-hmm. Life by Summer Walker. And then the revelation at the end. Um, Okay. So many things. So normally I ask, what was your biggest push moment and what are you giving birth to next? But you just answer both with yes. that. Yes. And this is amazing. Everybody needs to know about this. No. Um, no. In closing, what do you need from us? I think, well, first of all, um, I think we always need more funding, more connections to folks who can fund and who can collaborate and who can partner. We okay. really take to heart the philosophy that it takes a village. You know, we can't do this isolated in our, you know, as, as a, um, a program, isolating ourselves. You know, we talk about how harmful it is to isolate as a new mom. It's also harmful to isolate our work. And I think that's one of the problems with our health systems in general is they're fragmented, right? We talked about how things aren't connected well, think people aren't working together well. You could have in this one community, people doing similar things or need each other and never even know what's going on. And so- I know, yeah. 
Yeah, it's crazy making. So in Beloved, we're all about like, let's all come together. Let's put all the resources on the table in the community. What do people have to offer? And let's figure out how it works together. We don't need to recreate wheels. We don't need to, you know, um, reinvent things that already exist. And so a lot of times it's about, okay, let's bring the things that already exist to the work. Let's collaborate. Let's fill in the gaps of what's missing. So that's a lot of what Beloved is. Like I said, there were patient education that was missing that didn't exist anywhere that we had to create. Um, but there are many things that do exist that are really, really important for our mamas that our mamas just aren't connected to or don't have access to. So if anybody's like, wow, I have this thing that could be useful for a black mama, <laughs> please reach out. We love that. We love to connect our mamas to the resources that exist. In-kind donations. Yes. Yeah. For mama, baby, send her way. Every brand that's like, I love Jaisha and what she's doing, send her things for mama, baby, send yeah. her money. Yeah. And I want everyone, I think I can say this uh, confidently, Jaisha is willing to share how she did this so that we can save moms. Mm -hmm. And one thing I just want us as people, period, but absolutely as black people, we have endured so much and endured so much trauma on the daily. But if we work together and in this siloed approach and heal our scarcity mindset and really deep dive into an abundant mindset of collaboration, we will all win. Like. It's, it, it, we got to do this together. And the second we compete, the second we talk shit, the second we try to hoard, yeah. we are fulfilling mm -hmm. the desire of our oppressor. Exactly. When he started to break us up in Africa, continued the foolishness on the ship mm -hmm. and then on land. Yep. We have to work together. Mm -hmm. We deserve to work together. Yeah. Because we deserve a soft life. And the only way we will have that is by loving on and leaning on one another, because we are the solution to the problem they created for us. They are not our solution. No, the strategy, was divide and conquer. the strategy yeah. was divide and conquer. And when we allow ourselves to be divided, we are letting them win and we will continue to suffer. So yes, the beloved birth is all about collaboration and connection. And I will say too, transformation of Spanish centering that's happening so that's another big yes one. and yes. afro latinas yes. we love you you are us honey i yes. let everybody know you just got dropped off first in dalton sugar and we had to do cotton tobacco ain't no different don't let them make you think you mm -hmm. are different okay because you know you didn't just grow this color off <laughs> um we oh. got her originated from the same place because, you know, we all African, everybody. Sorry, yeah. anybody didn't want to know that. I, I have the dopest biology teacher in Oakland. She opened class. I was like, oh, I fucked with you. Miss Miss Newman. And she was like, I want everybody to know everyone's African. I was like. Yeah. I was like, now you know you had a, a Oakland Catholic high school because no other Catholic high school in the country is probably spitting that truth. But I I think that's why I aced that class because she set the tone for for her point of view. It was clear. I was like, wow, okay. Let's yeah. let's dive right in. Yeah. Um yes, so many things. I like I think as things keep going, keep coming back. But if there are other things you want to like deep dive into, like paid leave, or I, I even think what's super dope is the social services and public health department, like the nitty gritty of like systems, because it's confusing. Government, I feel like every government, you know, website we look like dinosaurs made it. I'm like, oh, hey. Am I supposed to find anything? Yeah. So maybe even like I would love a systems meets cheat sheet for the 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 user, everyday user, like how to access mm -hmm. um, programs and from Medicaid and beyond. Mm -hmm. Because I think even payers probably have a lot of things for everyday paying members that we don't know about. But um, I got to go check on my doula client. Um, but I love you so much. I'm so freaking proud of you. Um, remember, although some things seem like they're slow, you're, you're killing it and we are all better for your existence on this planet. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rachel. You are such, oh, all the things. I mean, I'm in love with you. Lucky to know you. So lucky to know you and just so glad that we have gotten connected and, Yes, please. Like, let's talk more. I would love to come on more. There's so much to talk about. So. I know. We just getting started, girl. 
<laughs> okay. Love you, girl. Love you too.